All right, thanks everybody for being here. It's nice to be able to present after 7.30. Uh, so, no disclosures. So, you know, when, when figuring out what I was going to speak about, I kind of asked myself uh, two questions. Uh, number one, um, what's my unique area of knowledge? Um, and number two, how can I use that, that knowledge to provide the most value to everybody that's listening in the audience here today? So. I realize that as, as residents, you know, we're on this journey where we're asking ourselves, like, how, how are we going to become the best surgeons possible? Um, it's a question I've been asking myself for the past seven years. And in trying to answer this question, um, I kind of stumbled onto this parallel journey where, I, you know, I asked myself, how can I actually become the best human being possible? Um, now, this is a, not, not to say that better than anybody else, but just the best version of my own self. Um, this journey became a very uh, conscious one for me somewhere around the beginning of research year. Uh, where there's a lot of changes, obviously. Uh, where I read some books, that really changed my life. Um, and so I made, it, I made it a specific goal to become a better human being. Um, since that time, I've read about 120 books. I've listened to hundreds of podcasts. Um, I created a, a mastermind group that meets about once a week on Skype to kind of go over these ideas with a couple of our friends. Um, and so my goal today is to share uh, the ideas that, that have had the biggest impact on making me a better surgeon and a better human being um, I hope that you find these ideas interesting, but more importantly, um, I hope that you experiment with some of these ideas and I uh, hope they change your life like they've changed mine. Um, so we'll kind of get, get into the deep stuff right away. Uh, one of the most important concepts I ever learned uh, was that of awareness. You know, we have, this, we have this ability to be aware that we don't always use, but um, basically becoming aware is the first step that we can use to solve any problem. You have to be aware of the problem before you can fix it. Now, unfortunately, we live in really a, a state of unawareness. The majority of the day, we're kind of on this autopilot. We're walking through life without really being conscious. Um, most of what we do is really controlled by uh, old habits, uh, routines, beliefs, um, and kind of primitive drives. And I kind of think of it as like an outdated software. Um, it's stuff that helps us survive, but it's not meant to make us thrive. Um, you know, and, and a good example of this is like the fight or flight response. A thousand years ago, you saw a saber-toothed tiger, it elicited fear, you got the fight or flight, you ran away. That extra jolt of energy helped you survive. But today, you know, we're afraid of things like public speaking. Uh, and so that fight or flight response, you know, doesn't really help you. You can't run away from your M&M presentation, or at least it won't help you. Um, and so uh, there's, there's many things like that that we're programmed with that aren't really useful these days. So I think one of the kind of secrets to living a better life is reprogramming yourself. Um, and we have, you know, as humans, we have that unique ability to be consciously aware of what we're doing, although we're not, most of the time, we're not aware. Um, and so my goal is kind of to go over some of these, uh, some of these ways to reprogram yourself. So how are you going to do that? So we have to realize that um, our outcomes in life are determined by our actions, and then our actions are determined by our thoughts. Um, the average human has an estimated 60,000 thoughts per day. Um, and interestingly, about 95% of those are the same today as they were yesterday. Um, and if you start to observe your thoughts, you'll notice that the majority of your thoughts are actually pretty useless. They don't really serve any purpose, completely random. Um, and so uh, one of the best things you can do is really begin to observe your thoughts throughout the day. There's, this, there's a great book that I, I really changed my life. It's called The Power of Now. And this guy, Eckhart Tolle, um, he talks about really becoming an observer of your thoughts, you know, at any point in your day. Um, you know, when you're walking, when you're driving, when you're brushing your teeth, when you're waiting in line, just kind of start to notice the thoughts that are in your head. Um, over time, um, you'll become better at uh, separating yourself from these thoughts. His whole premise is that, you know, those thoughts are not you. We kind of live with this voice in our head that um, we, we never really stop to question it. We think it's us, but it's really, it's just a bunch of randomness. Um, one specific technique that, that can help with this is meditation. Um, I know I, I've been meditating for about three years uh, for a couple minutes every morning. Um, and basically meditation just involves sitting somewhere quietly and just noticing those thoughts. Um, over time, you'll start to be able to decrease the amount of thoughts in your mind. And uh, you'll be able to ignore the thoughts that don't make sense, which is most of them. So I, I, I encourage everyone to experiment with meditation. That's my number one uh, kind of tip here. So now that we're trying to observe our thoughts, um, we have to have something to focus on. So what better thing to focus on than breathing? 
Um, interestingly, we've been taking 10 to 15 breaths per minute for the majority of our life. Um, but when was the last time you actually took a conscious deep breath? Um, could have been years ago. Um, so I mean, you could try right now, take a slow deep breath in and out. And interestingly, this has actually been shown to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. And it can actually counteract the fight or flight response, which is, is pretty cool. Um, so how can you use this to your advantage? Well, one, um, anytime you want to f increase your awareness throughout the day, you know, you're noticing your thoughts, just focus on your breathing. You know, slow down your breathing, slow deep breaths. Um, this will slowly, you know, you'll have more of these episodes per day where you're developing some awareness. Um, the other situation you can use it in is anytime you're anxious or nervous, um, again, focus on your breathing, take some slow deep breaths. That will counteract the fight or flight response. Um, so how do I use it at work? I mean, you can use it before a case. Um, you can use it in the middle of a long case where you're frustrated. Um, you, know, you can use it when you're waiting for a bad trauma to come in just to get yourself in the right mindset. Um, so it not only does it make you better at what you're doing, you'll actually enjoy what you're doing more. Um, another area that we are really unaware of is, a, is the words that we use. Um, I mean, words are just thoughts that we're saying aloud, um, and they have a tremendous power. Um, uh, I actually created a, a list of words that I try not to ever say because of the, I feel like they have a negative impact on me and the people around me. Um, for example, the word tired. I mean, the minute you say, I'm tired, you basically are tired. Um, it's, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, I've experimented and, uh, you know, I, I kind of, if I feel tired, um, I try to instead tell myself, I'm full of energy. And you kind of, it kind of works, uh, even if it's not true. You can kind of notice it. No, no one says, I'm energetic. You know, they, you kind of get that energy right when you say the word. So that's something you can experiment with. Uh, the second word I try never to say is stressed, because I feel like that's a internal response to, a, to an external stimulus. Um, interestingly, you'll notice that two people are in the same situation and they handle it totally differently. Differently, One person will say that they're stressed and the other person will you know, be happy and having the time of their life. So um, it never really benefits you to say that you're stressed. So I just I try to avoid that one altogether. Um, and then the word busy, this is an interesting one um, because it's, it's, really just a, it's, it's really just a lie. Um, we all have 24 hours a day. And no matter who you are, you're going to have 24 hours a day. And we have the ability to use that however we want. Whether we use most of that at work or not is up to us. Um, but I've replaced busy with, you know, this. I, I, I try to say, instead of saying, I'm busy, um, I'll instead say, this is not a priority for me at this time. And so what that does is that will empower you to start making better decisions with your time. Um, now, we can also use words in a positive way as well. You know, we all know about the placebo effect. Um, there's been a ton of research done on this, and basically, across the board, there's about uh, patients will improve about 30% of the time on their own without any medical treatment, um, and that's some of that's due to the power of just belief, belief that you're going to get better. Um, and so I think, you know, as surgeons, our, our words actually have a tremendous power, especially for our patients. So I think we can use this to our advantage by focusing on using encouraging words, um, you know, when possible. Uh, you know, at the end of every patient that I see on rounds, I always try to point out something that they're making progress on, whether it's ambulating or eating better or using their IS. And I say, hey, you're doing great. Keep up the good work. You're getting better. So I, I think that actually has a positive impact on, on their recovery. So I encourage you guys to come up with your own positive things to say. There's no downside. So next, I want to talk a little bit about, about happiness. So. The, you know, the, the kind of the ultimate goal of all our goals is really to, to be happy when it boils down to it. Um, but interestingly, we let the smallest things derail our happiness. You know, somebody cuts you off, uh, Starbucks messes up your coffee order, um, somebody says something to you in a weird way, um, and, and you know, like it can, it can ruin your day. Um, but interestingly, we have this kind of, we have this power, this ability that we don't really harness, and that's between any stimulus, an external stimulus, and our reaction to that, we can actually choose what we're going to do. Um, it's a very brief moment, uh, um, but uh, let me give you a quick example. So um, let's say you're the holding a 5513 pager, surgical consult service. You get a consult, it's 2 a.m., right? ER's calling you, they got a guy with abdominal pain. Um, how do you respond? Let's do a ab site style here. Uh, multiple choice. You say, yay, I get to help the patient. You say, B, I, I hate the ER. You say, see, I hate my life. Or, or D, you say, 
probably most commonly say B and C. Um, so, shouldn't but, but but shouldn't we be saying A? I mean, that's what we're here for, right? Uh, to help our patients. So, um, I read this awesome book. It's called Flip the Gratitude Switch by this guy named Kevin Clayson, and and his whole point is that it's really those little frustrations in our day that kind of derail our happiness. And so he advocates becoming aware of those situations throughout your day, those tiny frustrations. And the minute that you become aware, instead of being frustrated, you look for gratitude in that situation. And you know, in our field, we always have a lot to be grateful for. It's right in front of us. So uh, you, you, know, you can be grateful that the patient's uh, serving as an opportunity for you to learn. Um, you can be grateful that you're helping the, the ER physician. Um, and if you really can't find anything to be grateful for, you can always be grateful that you're not the patient. So you really always have something to be grateful for. Um, so you know, you, I would say I would encourage people to use these little opportunities throughout the day to increase your awareness. It's like, it's like exercising your awareness muscle. The next concept I want to talk about is, is, is deliberate practice. Uh, so this is a process that can help us become more aware and also become better learners. So there's been a ton of research done on the topic of mastery where um, the people that are best in their field are compared to the, the other individuals in the field. Um, and wh what's been noticed is that uh, the masters tend to focus on using deliberate practice, uh, which is basically just um, being consciously aware of what you're learning, um, as opposed to just going through the motions. Um, and interestingly, when I was an intern on vascular surgery, I remember uh, Dr. Dawson, I don't know if he's here today, but uh, he always used to ask at the end of his, end of his clinic, like, what did you learn today? Um, and it was always kind of kind of caught you off guard because you know, you're seeing 10 new patients, you sort of learned at least 10 new things, um, but you had to, had to kind of pause and think about it. Um, and, and, and that's always a very interesting concept, that, but being consciously aware of what you're thinking about significantly improves how much you can learn. Um, and so how can you actually apply this? So for the last couple of years, I've been trying to, to apply it in, you know, as a surgery resident. Um, I try to write down what I'm learning. So there's a couple key time points in the day. You know, during rounds and at the end of rounds, I make sure I write down at least one thing I learned. Um, same goes for, you know, during, during each case, I try to pay attention to one thing I'm learning and write it down at the end of the case. Um, but then you can also create little challenges for yourself, like in the operating room. Um, you know, if you're doing another cholecystectomy, uh, you can just look at it as a routine cholecystectomy and you might not get much out of it. Or you can focus on something like, you know, having the perfect port placement. Um, dissecting out the cystic duct without any prompting from the attending, or uh, challenging yourself to get to a certain point in the procedure by a certain time. Um, and those things will actually make you better. So I encourage everyone to try those, um, because it's actually, it's actually been proven to make you better. So now, um, now that we've developed some uh, awareness, uh, I, I think it's important to create some goals. Now, you know, as surgeons, we know a lot about goals. I mean, every single case that we do has a goal. Uh, you know, whether it's to stop the bleeding, uh, fix the hernia, get the tumor out. Um, but it's interesting that we kind of walk through life without sometimes having any goals. Um, and so one of the one of the ways we can uh, basically create goals is, I think we need to start with something that I like to call uh, a definite major purpose. Um, this is a concept I read about from this guy named Napoleon Hill. Um, and basically, you figure out, you know, what's my purpose in life? And it becomes, try to make it as specific as possible. You know, not just to help people, um, but maybe you're going to help people by, uh, you know, developing the best mesh for hernia repair or, you know, using stem cells to regenerate generate a certain tissue. Um, you know, I think everyone should have one of these, and you may not know what it is, but, you know, something you can experiment with. Um, my own definite major purpose involves, you know, improving surgical education, and so as a direct byproduct of this, I've, you know, made, a me uh, made my surgical education website, and I've created a surgical success manual. Um, and you know, although it's in its infancy, it's it's just a direct result of having that purpose. Um, once you have that purpose, you can work backwards and create goals and kind of reverse engineer your your life um, to do stuff every single day that's going to help you get to that purpose. Um, a similar kind of concept is something called a life manifesto, where you you can create uh, something where. You know, it's not necessarily a purpose, but it's something you're going to do every single day. So I borrowed mine from this guy named Robin Sharma, um, and, it, and basically it, it's to leave every person, place, and situation better than I found it. Um, and so, so how do I apply that? Well, you know, we're not just the way I look at it. We're not just here to help the patient. Um, we're here to improve the lives of everyone that we interact with, whether that's the patient's family, our fellow residents, nurses, uh, scrub techs. Um, 
you know, people look up to us as surgeons, and um, I think having that awareness and having that manifesto or purpose, it uh, it makes us see the importance of all the little things we do every day because they do have a really big impact on people's lives. Um, so I encourage everyone to make their own purpose or their own manifesto, um, and and just watch and see the the impact it can have on your life. Um, now to, to to have success, you know, I. I think we, we're good at creating goals for our career, but we oftentimes neglect the other areas of our life. Uh, so I, I, I also borrowed this concept called the Big Five from, uh, from this guy, Robin Sharma. And he says, you know, pick out the most important areas of your life that you want to improve in. Um, and most people are going to have relatively similar goals. I break mine down into these categories here. You know, my health, my career, my legacy, my growth, uh, my finances, and my relationships. And so... Uh, what I do is at the end of every year, I sit down and create goals within each of those categories. So um, it could be, you know, I, I could have a goal for how much I want to weigh next year or how many books I want to read uh, or how much money I want to save. Um, and so just having that awareness makes you much more likely to hit those goals. And um, it's, had a, it's had a pretty big impact on my life. Uh, once you make those goals, I like to use this format called a SMART, SMART goal, which you, know, you may have heard about. Um, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-based. And so I'll give you a, an example from my own experience as a surgery resident. Um, you know, my bigger goal is to become a great surgeon, um, but one of my goals last year was to finish a surgical textbook. Um, you know, 1,800 pages. I've been kind of putting it off. Uh, but I said, you know, I'm just going to read 100 pages a month. And so I was actually able to finish the entire Schwartz book, um, textbook, um, and I did it using some of the techniques that I'll talk about next. So my next point is that you know the little things in life they're really everything. Success is not about doing you know some magical some big magical things every now and then. It's really about doing all these little things consistently over time. Um, so one of the questions I ask myself is so what's the best way to read this surgical textbook? Um, I, I stumbled upon this book called the uh, the, the compound effect and this really uh, this really helped me kind of. Uh, develop my reading plan, and so this guy that Darren Hardy that wrote this book, his whole point is that you know you, you're going to gain huge rewards from taking small steps every single day, um, and so I, I ended up making a plan to basically just read for 15 minutes a day. That was where I started. Um, he points out the power of, of momentum, though. Um, you know, when I started residency, people always said read every day, but you know that was kind of like telling people if they want to be healthy just to eat right and exercise. Um, it's not not that effective. Uh, but you know when this guy puts it this way about doing it every single day and never missing a day, um, it has a tremendous power. It's, you, you build up this momentum, um, and and I, I'll, I'll take a minute to say that when I say every day, uh, I'm talking about resident days, surgery resident days. Those are not like it's kind of like dog years. Um, you know, I consider a call day and a post call day as one day. So, a resident week has about five days in it. Um, so, so for for my reading purposes, I was reading five days a week, um, and so. So I started reading for 15 minutes a day, and then he, he also talks about the power of tracking. Um, anything that we track makes us more accountable. And so I just created a template, and I would put a checkbox every day um, you know, when I read. Um, on occasion, I would miss a day, and then the next day I would have to do two reading sessions, which is kind of like punishment. So uh, it's even a further motivator to keep reading every single day. Um, so I encourage everyone to, to kind of come up with their own, you know, come up with something that you want to do every single day. Um, but you know, this still required. I felt like this still required a lot of effort, and I thought, man, can't this be any easier? Uh, so, enter the next book. So this one's called The Power of Habit. Uh, it's one that one, do, actually Dr. Height uh, told me about. Um, interesting concept. So think about this. You know, when was the last time you skipped brushing your teeth in the morning? Probably, probably never, uh, um, or at least close to that. Uh, but 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 when was the last time you uh, um, skipped a day of surgical reading? Uh, probably yesterday. Uh, so so it's kind of interesting. It's like I, I don't think I don't think having great teeth is on anyone's list of lifetime goals. Uh, but I think being a great surgeon is. So so why do we you know why are we so consistent with brushing our teeth and not with reading? It's kind of weird. Um, but it really boils down to one word: habit. Right? We've been conditioned since we were kids to to brush our teeth every single day. Um, and so uh, it becomes a habit, one that you don't even have to think about. Um, so I wanted to know how can I make reading a habit um, so that I do it every single day without using much energy. Um, 
And so there's this, there's this thing called a habit loop, which uh, the author talks about. I don't know if you can see it real well. There's a, every habit loop involves a cue. Uh, that's some sort of stimulus that makes you think about the uh, habit, the routine that you're going to do, and then a re reward. So since I was already brushing my teeth every day, every morning, um, I decided I'll use that as, as my cue. So right after I brush my teeth, I'm going to read for 15 minutes. Um, this is known as like a keystone habit. You know, you already brush your teeth, and so you can really use that to l link a new t uh, habit onto that. Um, so, uh, so the cue was brushing my teeth. The new routine was reading 15 minutes in the morning, and then the reward is that I checked. I, I got to put a check marks in my template, um, and then by the end of the month, it's a nice reward to see that the entire uh, template filled out. So, but you know, to become a great surgeon, you got to do more than just read. Um, you know, you got to become a master of the anatomy. You got to perfect your surgical skills. So I wanted to start adding these onto my daily routines. But you know, as we all know, we, we always make great goals for when we get home. You know, we're going to exercise, we're going to read, we're going to cook a healthy meal. But it, it pretty much never happens. Um, and that's due to this concept called willpower depletion. Uh, basically, as you go out through the day making decisions and doing things, you, you deplete your willpower. And by the end of the day, you, you don't have enough willpower to make a good decision. So and next, I ended up stumbling onto this book called *The Morning*, uh, *The Miracle Morning*. Um, and this guy's whole premise is that you really should be doing the most, the activities that are most relevant to your success in in the morning, or as, at least as early as possible in the day. Um, and you know, if you're anything like me, you're probably thinking like, I really don't want to get up any earlier. Um, I barely get up as it is, uh, and so I, you know, I don't have the time to do this. But you know, really, we all have a routine as it is right now. Um, you got to ask yourself, what's your current routine? So when I read this book, my routine was to make a breakfast, uh, read the news, and check emails. Now, none of those actually align with any of my long-term goals. Um, so over time, I developed a new morning routine that I, you know, that I start off with meditation, exercise, reading, and you know, reviewing anatomy. Um, and, and that's had a tremendous impact on um, the progress I've made. Um, so I encourage everyone to make their own morning routine or, or modify their morning routine. And you know you you can start real simple, five minutes of reading, just every morning, you know, right after you brush your teeth or right after you eat, just develop that. And over time, you can add on to it, basically like I did. Um, at one point, I had a whole 45-minute routine, um, but you know you can modify that based on your schedule, your rotation that you're on. Um, so now that you know, now that we've made, developed some awareness, we've made some goals, some routines. Um, it's important to learn how to overcome obstacles um, because we we often have this voice in our head uh, that tells you that you should quit. You know, we've all we've all experienced that from time to time. Um, this this so there's this, this concept known as grit. Um, it's defined as the uh, ability to endure uh, a short-term pain uh, for the achievement of a long-term goal. Um, it kind of sounds like residency, except the short-term part. Um, so, so I kind of think of this, I kind of refer to this as like dominating the voice in your own head. Um, but the greater, the greater your grit, the more successful you'll be at basically anything you do. Um, and luckily, you can actually increase your grit. Um, and in order to do so, you have to realize that all growth really occurs outside your comfort zone. That's true if you're trying to grow muscle. That's true if you're trying to grow your mind. Um, and so um, we have to look for things that push us into this, to areas that are you know, painful. And so uh, here's uh, here's me and Dr. Salcedo uh, working on increasing our grit. This is a uh, this is a 2015 uh, CIM California International Marathon, 26.2 miles. So I, th I think most people that run marathons they like running, they enjoy it a little bit. But I think probably for me and Salcedo, I don't think that's the case. Uh, <laughs> I think we probably ran a, about one mile a month combined before this training. Um, and so. So, you know, I really wanted to challenge myself. Really, for me, this was all about a mental challenge. I didn't, the physical thing I didn't care so much about. But um, I said, you know, if I'm going to run it, I'm going to run it wearing a 40-pound weight vest. And so um, you can see I got my little Dominate license plate on there uh, as a reminder to increase my grit. Uh, but you might not be able to see it. So there's actually a funny story behind this one, so I'll talk about that real quick. Um, so this is a you know so this is after about a year and a half after the Boston bombing at, at the marathon, and so if you, you can't tell from here, but that that weight vest looks pretty much like a bomb. Um, so you know I'm, I'm I, you know I'm, I'm a brown guy, I got a beard. I'm, I'm wearing I'm wearing this thing that looks like a bomb. Um, 
you know, to, to an event that has about 10,000 people at it. Uh, and so, you know, the night, the day before, you know, you got my wife and my mom calling me like, dude, don't, don't wear this, don't wear this vest, you know, it's not worth it. Um, and I've already been training for 10 weeks, so that's a long time for me. Uh, so I, you know, obviously when your mom and your wife tell you something, you usually should listen. Um, but in this situation, I did compromise. So I wore a blue, blue, uh, fleece. So you can't really even see the weight vest. Um, and then, of course, for good measure on the back, I put an American flag, so no one would shoot me. Uh, it worked. I, I survived. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think anyone realized I was wearing a, a weight vest. I was trying to motivate people, but uh, I think it just looked like I had an odd distribution of body fat. But in, in either case, uh, you know, me and Salcedo, we crossed the finish line before they disassembled the whole thing, about five and a half hours. Apparently, at six hours, everything's gone. Um, so, so we, so we made it. Um, so, I encourage everyone to, uh, you know, kind of create your own challenges that push you outside your comfort zone. Um, if you want to borrow the weight vest, I'll hook you up. So, you know, so after this, you know, I, I asked myself, okay, cool, we did this. What's next? Uh, so I come up, I came up with a bunch of other challenges. So, so but for about the day after the marathon, uh, I came up with this idea of taking cold showers. So, for for about one year, um, I limited myself to only cold showers, um, where I where I would just allow one warm shower a week, um, and and ice cold showers the other six days. And so, I quit after about a year. But it, it I think it did help me increase my grit. Um, never, <laughs> never got easier. Never. Um, but even you know, even throughout your day, you can uh, you can kind of infuse these little challenges. So some days I'll try not to eat anything until lunch, just you know, trying to overcome that pain sensation or uh, hunger sensation. Um, some days I'll challenge myself not to hit snooze. Um, but you know, I, I, it's it's kind of fun, it's kind of painful, but I think that it all helps you grow. Um, and the good thing is, you know, once you increase your ability, uh, once you increase your grit, this is a, this is kind of like an ability that translates to any any area of your life. So um, I feel like now I can, I can, I can, you know, go through a longer operation on less food uh, and enjoy the process a lot more than I used to in the past. So, um, you know, come up with your own challenges and uh, increase your grit. So, um, so the next concept I want to talk about is 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 this thing called the growth mindset. Um, you know, failure basically is is inevitable if you're trying to do anything anything big. And um, it's not really so much about whether you're going to fail. It's, it's about how you're going to respond to failure. Um, and so this, this author, Carol Dweck, um, she actually spent her whole life researching how people respond to failure. And she came up with this concept of two mindsets, a fixed mindset and a uh, growth mindset. So in the fixed mindset, people assume that their intelligence is, is fixed and that they can't grow. So they basically do everything they can to avoid looking stupid. Um, and that has some negative consequences for them. Um, whereas those people that have a growth mindset, they look at, you know, how can I learn? And they look at every every failure as an opportunity to 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 learn. Um, and you know, we're as surgeons, we're actually all about this. I mean, M and M conference. I've been sitting, you know, 6:45 to 7:30 essentially for the last seven years, sitting in this classroom or a similar room, you know. And there's never been a shortage of M and Ms to present. Um, even even we even though we have some of the, you know, lead, world experts in your area of surgical expertise, there's still, you know, failures that happen. Um, and so, so how do you, so it's really not about looking at failure as failure, it's looking at it as, a, as an area for improvement. Um, and so I've tried to, for the last couple of years, think of failure as, as how can I use this to improve myself? Um, so a couple of times th that I use this throughout the day is, so after, again, after rounds, I use, I, I take a minute to just think like, okay, what could I have done better this morning? Um, you know, that, that, after rounds, I noticed that you know I, I made a decision and the attending said something else. How could I have done that better? Um, I write, I jot a little note down just to, to make it more aware. Um, and I do the same thing after every case. There's always something you could do better after every case. Um, but but interestingly, you can do the same thing in your life. Um, you know, you can look at how can I have been a better human being? How could I could I have been nicer to somebody? Um, could I did did I neglect my health today? Did I neglect my family? Um, and over time, if you keep writing these, these things down at the end of the day, um, you know you become a little bit better today than you were yesterday, and you kind of inch your way closer to living a successful life. So I encourage everyone to you know look at failure as a as, as an area for improvement and and kind of keep track of these things. 
So f the final concept I want to talk about is the, is the importance of relationships. So, uh, you know, we do a lot of cool and crazy stuff here, um, but, you know, really it wouldn't be as exciting if, if it weren't for the people that we did it with. Um, you know, saving a life, it's, it's a team effort. And luckily at, at, at the Med Center here, we're surrounded by, you know, a, a ton of awesome people. Um, and, and being a resident, you know, working 80 hours a week, uh, it, it's really made me uh, realize the importance of making time for relationships. You know, I have some of my best friends living around here. I grew up around here. Um, but, you know, sometimes I went a year without seeing them, which I thought was kind of crazy uh, because, you know, we all know that nothing's guaranteed in life. You know, even if you're healthy today, uh, you could get hit by a car or you could get cancer. I mean, we, we see it every day in people that are our age or even younger. So, um, you know, you have to understand the importance of time. And uh, and so I did a couple things. One, I wanted to strengthen the, the relationships that I had. Um, and so I, I heard about this concept where you just you write down, you know, all the people you want to see in the year. Um, so I made a list of about, about 25 people um, the first year that I did this. And by the end of the year, um, you know, I made, it, I made it a goal to see two people a month. By the end of the year, I had seen 22 of the 25 on my list. Um, and it's actually one of the coolest things I did. So I think, you know, relationships, I think, is, I, think I encourage everyone to, to do something similar, whether you want to meet 10 people or 100 people. Um, I think it just makes you really aware of, you know, how long it's been since you've seen some of the great people you know. Um, the other the other kind of point about relationships is that, uh, you know, we're surrounded by so many awesome people. Um, we should be creating new relationships all the time. And so I, I just made a simple, again, a simple a goal to make one new friend every day. So, you know, we meet new residents, new students, new nurses, new scrub techs every single day. And so um, at the end of the day, I would just try to, try to write down the name and just kind of try to remember who they were. Um, you might think it's like I'm a borderline stalker, but it's actually pretty cool. It works. You know, it's, it's definitely increased the, the, the number of relationships that I have with people here. Um, so now I just want to uh, take a minute. I have a four minute video. I think this, uh, this video kind of captures some of the, the highlights of what, what I said. Um, it's not going to make any sense until I explain it. So just, just kind of bear with me here. Let's see. Let's see if it works. Five hundred seventy one million two hundred thirty thousand pounds of paper towels are used by Americans every year. If we could, correction, wrong figure, 13 billion used every year, if we could reduce the usage of paper towels, one paper towel per person per day, 571,230,000 pounds of paper not used. We could do that. Now, there are all kinds of paper towel dispensers. There's the trifold. People typically take two or three. There's the one that cuts it that you have to tear off. People go one, two, three, four, tear. This much, right? There's the one that cuts itself. People go one, two, three, four. Or there's the same thing, but recycled paper. You have to get five of those because they're not an absorbent, of course. The fact is, you can do it all with one towel. Key, two words. This half of the room, your word is shake. Let's hear it. Shake. Louder. Shake. Your word is full. Oh. Again. Oh. Really loud. Shake. Oh. Okay. Wet hands. Shake. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Why twelve? 12 apostles, 12 tribes, 12 zodiac signs, 12 months. What I like the best is the biggest number with one syllable. <laughs> Trifold. Fold. Drop. Cuts itself. Fold, 
The fold is important because it allows interstitial suspension. You don't have to remember that part, but trust me. Cuts itself. You know, the funny thing is, I get my hands drier than people do with three or four because they can't get in between the cracks. If you think this isn't as good, now there's now a real fancy invention. It's the one where you wave your hand and it kicks it out. It's way too big a towel. Let me tell you a secret. If you're really quick, if you're really quick, and I can prove this, this is half a towel from the dispenser in this building. How? As soon as it starts, you just tear it off. It's smart enough to stop. You don't need to have a towel. So, all right, so <clears throat> this video, although you may think it doesn't have anything to do with the talk, but it actually puts a lot of the points that I talked about together. Um, one, it just shows how unaware we are. Um, you know, I've seen this video a couple years ago, so I, I kind of cringe every time people grab like eight towels. Um, but so it'll, it'll help you develop your awareness, you know, instead of just drying your hands and just kind of doing it on autopilot, you'll, you'll be consciously aware. This will help you increase your awareness throughout the day. Um, it's kind of interesting because washing your hands also serves as a cue for creating a new habit. Um, and so instead of taking multiple towels, you'll just take one. And this, this, that's basically how you create a new habit. You just wait for the cue and implement your routine. Um, it also, t you know, it's also funny because it's, it's using a paper towel is such a little thing, but it's something you do every single day, multiple times a day. And you know, the power, you can never under underestimate the power of those little things to have a huge impact on, on, on your life and on the world. Um, and so, spread the word and I'll, I'll, I'll be watching. <laughs> so, I won't, I won't I, I basically, I just want to conclude real quick by saying, you know, I talked about a lot of ideas. I hope you found them um, interesting or entertaining, but I hope you pick at least one idea and start today and just kind of experiment with wh whatever one resonates with you. Um, I highlighted all the actionable steps. You know, we're <laughs> surgeons who like to do stuff. So these are all things that I've actually tried, and you can actually try, you know, starting today. To increase your awareness, you can meditate, focus on your breathing, think about the words that you're saying, you know, choose a response instead of a reaction, start practicing deliberately. In terms of your goals, you can create a purpose, um, create a manifesto, develop your big five, uh, create some uh, smart goals. Um, you know, focusing on the little things, you can build a new habit, a new morning routine, use tracking. In terms of grit, do something that's difficult, go outside your comfort zone. And increase your growth mindset by looking for areas for improvement in yourself after rounds, at, you know, after a case or every night. Um, in terms of relationships, meet the people that you know matter to you. Make sure you carve out time for those people and make new friends every single day. So, and I want to finish off by saying uh, thank you to all the uh, the awesome attendings and fellow residents, all the nurses, nurse practitioners, everybody that's been here. Um, has has made my uh, residency an, uh, you know a really awesome process an enjoyable one and so um, you know I can't thank everybody enough for, for contributing to that um, and I, obviously I also want to thank my wife uh, who's here today um, you know she's for all of her support for everything she's done you know and in keeping our family functional um, you know can't can't thank her enough for that so I appreciate that um, and so I'll end off with uh, just one final video. My little daughter, Rhea, has some words, if this thing works. Let's see. Oh, it doesn't work. Ah, they don't work.
work, sorry. Let's see if it works like this. Sorry, I'm not sure how to make it work, but. All right, well, anyway, she says, bye bye, see you. Um, and so, uh, with that, I'll conclude. mature beyond your years and really insightful about uh, this process. So I think we have some time for questions. So I have a question. So I used to be really good at all of these things, um, <laughs> I, I, would, I would think. But I never realized what willpower depletion was until I had kids um, who deplete my willpower every day at the end of the day. <laughs> um, how do you incorporate these goals uh, with having your daughter and, and a family? That's definitely a good question, and, and, and you're right. Your your priorities will shift, uh, but um, and, and also your time is is more focused on you know, your kids and your work. Um, but that's where you had to prioritize. You're right. You're not going to get as much done. Um, you know, once you have kids, at least you think. But I, I don't know. I think I'm actually more productive now because when I look back, I say, man, I had so much time and I didn't use it that well. I think we all kind of have that kind of you know thought process once we have kids. Um, but I think you just had to prioritize. Um, you had to realize that your kids are a big priority, um, and you know one of my goals has been like you know, you know making sure I spend time with my daughter every single day, making sure my phone's not in my you know I'm not on my phone when I'm around them. Um, so you're right, your your goals are going to be less, um, but I, I feel like you have to remember that that that's such a huge priority. I know it's it can be hard at times, but um, just got to prioritize the best you can. Alicia. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it just it makes the nights even harder. So, um, more 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 reason to do something in the morning, if you know, as much as you can. Just to that note, if you look at the habits of some of your successful attendings here, Bill Pevick, uh, Rick Bold, their morning start either in the gym, at the pool, that that time in the morning, I think, is often the most precious to a surgeon. And I, I think it's early, but it's. And I think like, you don't have to exercise for an hour. I mean, you can just even doing like five minutes. It puts you in the right mind state, you know, mindset, and uh, you know, gets the blood moving. So, I, you know, when my schedule is real tight, I even do like a limited work, you know, uh, routine where I'll do each activity for just like one minute, just to maintain my habit, and my routine. So it only takes ten minutes instead of thirty minutes, but it's better than not doing it at all. Um, I didn't specifically look at errors, but you know, just uh, making things more aware. I think there's so many. I mean, you, there's millions of examples that we could talk about. Um, you know, even a couple weeks ago at Research Day, uh, um, Dr. I forget is it Kibby. Uh, she talked about you know we've been doing research on just male mice this whole time. It's like such a it's a concept you never even like thought about, and and, and just not even being aware of that. Um, but just anytime you increase your awareness, you're going to be better at whatever you're doing. Um, I I haven't no, I haven't noticed that about errors or read that about you know, decreasing errors, but even doing things like focusing on when you're practicing for FLS, you know, just having those time targets, um, that level of awareness just makes you makes you better because you're actually I don't know for whatever it is you're actually consciously thinking about it. Um, but yeah, that's that's even more evidence to try to be more aware. Still said. I have an end question. First, thank you for putting up that picture of us crossing the finish line and leaving it up for the longest time. 
Yeah, I think um, well, a couple of things. I think you're really right about having a mentor will decrease the amount of time that it takes to achieve a certain uh, you know level that you're trying to get to because you're not going to have to discover everything on your own. Um, it, it, that's true in any field. Um, you know, you can think of like a personal trainer for working out. Uh, but although I don't have one specific person, I think as residents, it's kind of we have this awesome, you know. Uh, we're very fortunate because we can work with so many different attendings and I, I mean I see them all as my mentors and um, they all do everything slightly differently and I really pay especially in the last year I really pay attention to that because I always try to predict what what would I do and then I notice how someone else does it and why they do it differently um, and so I I think you know it's a unique role um, it's kind of sad that you know at the end of residency you don't have the ability to you do but it's it's not you know a daily thing see how different masters do it. I consider all the attendees that I work with masters and what they're doing. So um, I, I think it's, it's a great point. You can learn from every single one of them. And, and I think I hope, I hope everyone is learning from every single one of them. parting comments. One, I think as an academic surgeon, I'd add that in addition to that 15 minutes of reading, is 15 minutes of writing. Whether that's writing a note to your mother, your spouse, the, developing the habit of writing is, I think, really hard for surgeons. Most of us went into it because we liked the lab better than we liked writing a term paper. But developing that habit, I think, is key. Uh, so adding, I love that habit idea. And my final parting comment, particularly since your wife is here, is I think you should have listened to your wife and your mother. So <laughs> just take that home. I usually do. I thank, usually do. Thank you very much. It was really great.